All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to CS 2050. The topic of today is Bayzut's identity. And some elementary group theory. And I may pause this in the middle so it's two videos. I haven't decided how long things will take. Um, so today, again, we are number theorists. Uh, Bayzut's identity is incredibly useful, and it shows up like all the time. This is a powerful tool. It shows up, um, I mean, it doesn't really show up, but it's like, uh, in any theory, you have developed a set of mathematical tools. Uh, you, got a, you got yourself a toolbox of a hammer and a screwdriver and so on, and Bayzut's is a really powerful tool. It's a good thing to have in your toolbox because you want to prove some statement. You whip out Bayzut's, the theorem becomes trivial. That's usually how it works. Uh, Bayzut's basically says uh, uh, for all uh, a comma b in the natural numbers, uh, there exists uh, s comma t, which are integers, so they can be negative, not necessarily natural, uh, such that the GCD of a and b is equal to a linear combination of a and b, a s plus b t. That's the elementary statement of Bayzut's identity. Um, first off, uh, we call this a linear combination. Have you guys seen the term linear combination in another class? Perhaps linear algebra? That's what a linear combination is uh, related to. This is a linear combination. You have A and B. You take some constants, S and T. You uh, multiply them by the constants. You add them together. You'll get. Um, uh, a linear combination, and we claim that for any numbers a, uh, a and b, there's a linear combination of the numbers a and b to equal um, the GCD, right? So let's do some examples, and then we'll talk about some more properties. Further, actually, Bayzut actually says something stronger, that uh, the GCD of a and b is the least positive uh, linear combination of a and b. is the least. We can prove this part, at least. OK. Um, pop quiz. What is the GCD of n and n plus 1 for all n? the GCD. So we're looking for the smallest number. Recall the definition of a GCD of A and B. The GCD of A comma B is some number D such that D is the, is the greatest such number such that D divides into A and D divides into B. My markers are not so given that, what is the GCD of two sequential numbers? One. One. Why? So there's intuition. It's obviously one. It better be one. I hope it's one. But then you should assert to a buffoon, anyone else, that why is it one? You should be able to explain, as in prove, why it's one. I'll allow you to say it's one, because it should obviously be one. But if you had to prove it's one, what would you do? So suppose um, there's A and B, A divided into n and b divided to n plus 1. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, a minus b should be divided into, or b, b, b minus a should be divided into n plus 1 minus n. So it should be. That's 1. Yeah. Exactly. That's a great, that's a great proof. So we suppose that the GCD of a comma, excuse me, uh, n comma n plus 1 is equal to d. We want to prove that d is equal to 1. We know it's the GCD. So we know that D divides into N, and D divides into N plus 1. By definition, we know that there exists K comma L, uh, such that D, D, DK is equal to N, DL is equal to N plus 1, right? So then you take the difference of those, you get DL minus DK, which is this is greater than this one, because this is N plus 1 and this is N, is equal to N plus 1 minus N. So we get DL minus K is equal to 1. So therefore, d divides into 1. What number divides into 1? It has to be less than 1. 
and d must also be greater than zero. So therefore, that implies these one. Kind of a rough proof, quick proof. But again, you, this is not so much, this is not something like that super important to proof, but like you assert to yourself a truth rather than to a reader of a proof. And you quickly kind of put the pieces together in your head as a puzzle, and you're like, okay, there. Yeah, it's definitely one. Um, proof above, above, above all else is not necessarily just to convince other people something is true, but even to convince yourself something is true. It's the way mathematical reasoning works. Um, what about the GCD of, uh, excuse me, what is the GCD of uh, 25 and 11? One. one. You don't have to prove that. Give me a linear combination of 25 <coughs> times something plus 11 times something. Which equals 1. This is a difficult question. I'm asking you for such s and t such that 25 times s plus 11 times t is equal to 1. And again, s and t can be negative. Almost necess by necessity, they sh one should be negative. Right? Can you come up with, has anyone got a brute force calculation? Anyone find one? Yes? 4, OK. So that's 100 minus 99. Yeah, that's 1. Great. Excellent, excellent. Um, there are, in fact, infinitely many such pairs. Uh, we're not going to be able to prove by Bayesian's identity. Uh, we don't have yet the mathematical tools. So we'll take it as fact. We will instead give you an algorithm to compute such S and T. So we'll give you a way mechanically to determine S and T for any pairs, A and B. Um, let's do one more. This one should be illustrative. The GCD of 8 and 4 is what? 4. So give me a linear combination such that 4 is equal to 8 something plus 4 something. 0 and 1. Zero and one? OK, that works. Can I get a different? Actually, that works too well. Let me get a different non-trivial pair. One, negative 1. 1 and negative 1. That also works. OK. So we get 0, 1. We got 1, negative 1. OK. Is there a third pair? I am ashamed to say that I actually found a harder pair first. That makes so much more sense. Can we find another pair? Negative 1, 3. Negative 1, 8 plus 3 is 4. OK. This is still not the pair that I found. But let's see if uh, uh, right, the negatives are backwards. Oh, negative 1, 3, yes, yeah. OK. Is there another pair? Two negative three is the one I found. Okay. In fact, you can prove that there exist infinitely many such pairs. Um, the reason I like this example is let's suppose we did one negative three, right? So we know that four is equal to eight times negative one plus four times three, right? Notice though that uh, eight and four, the GCD of them, of course, is four. Right? So consider just any linear combination of 8 and 4. It's go you're going to be able to pull out the GCD of both of those. Right? So this is actually equal to 4 times uh, 2 times negative 1 plus 1 times 3. Right? So in fact, whatever a linear combination is of two numbers, if the GCD is supposed to be positive, Excuse me, if any linear combination of two numbers, two natural numbers, if the linear combination of them is positive, it can, the smallest such number it can be must be the GCD. Right? Let's prove it, for example. For example, no, no linear combination of 8 and 4 can be an odd number, first of all. Right? Even, you're working with evens, you're working with evens, the combinations of evens and evens is just evens. Right? So certainly, uh, Certainly, it can't be odd. Let's try and argue why it must be at least be uh, the, 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 the GCD is the least number, right? So we have, um, let's say we have A, S plus B, T, OK? And we know that the GCD of A comma B is equal to some number D, OK? 
If the GCD of A and B is equal to D, that means D is a divisor of A and B, right? A div D divides into A and D divides into B. So what we can write is that DK is equal to A and DL is equal to B, where K and L are what's ever left over, right, For, from both A and B. So then we get that AS plus BT is going to be DKS plus uh, DLT, right? Which is then equal to DKS plus D, excuse me, plus LT, right? So uh, for what possible values can this be between uh, 0 and uh, uh, D minus 1, right? Does there, now of course, a linear combination could be negative. A linear combination, of course, can be zero. Just set s and t to be zero. It's, it can be zero. But I claim that there is no number between zero and the GCD that the linear combination can be. Why? Suppose that this is equal to some number less than d. Well, it has d as the product. So d, again, is a number greater than or equal to one. So d times something can't be, if it's less than d, can only be zero. Right? So this should imply to you that d is the smallest such number. That's a positive linear combination. You can have, of course, many interesting negative linear combinations. You can have, of course, a linear combination of 0 by just setting st to 0. But if you have a number between a number that's positive, the least of such numbers must, of course, be the GCD. Right? Questions on that? Again, sort of a loose proof. We didn't structure it quite well. but. Yes? What's this proof even saying? The proof is saying that if you have a linear combination of two numbers, the smallest positive linear combination must be the GCD. If the GCD of two numbers is 10, a linear combination of A and B cannot be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. The smallest linear co positive linear combination is 10. That's what it's saying. Not a particularly a useful fact, but it's just sort of interesting. Right. Questions on... on uh, Bayesutes in general. Um, let's uh, prove it. The way we're going to, we're not going to be able to prove that S and T exist, but we will just give you a way to compute S and T, which were we to prove the correctness of that would prove that S and T exists. Instead, we'll just give you the algorithm. We don't yet have the mathematical tools to prove S and T exists. Yes? Is it like saying it scales by the GCD? Like whenever you... You can think of it that way. Certainly. Like, if you have a GCD of two even numbers, no, multiplica no co linear combination of them can be one. If you, have a, if, if you have two numbers whose GCD is three, no linear combination of them can be one or two. GCD of two numbers is four, no combination of them can be one, two, or three. Does that answer your question? Right, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so we're going to give you a way, given A and B, to compute... Uh, S and T. The way it works is what's called the extended Euclidean algorithm. The extended Euclidean algorithm is that you take the Euclidean algorithm and then you take then you extend it. That's why it's called the extended Euclidean algorithm. You take the intermediary steps of the Euclidean algorithm, and the Euclidean algorithm is the one we found for computing the GCD. And then it turns out the intermediary steps of the GCD are also, if you reverse it, a way to compute S and T. So it's a little cumbersome and a little tricky, but we're going to try and do sort of a high-level example. Everyone remember the Euclidean algorithm? It looks like this, def GCD of A comma B. Uh, if B is equal to 0, return A. Else, return uh, GCD of what? Do we remember? <coughs> It's B, A mod B, yeah? One second. Let's see if I have a better marker. So when we computed the GCD, it's a recursive algorithm. We basically went through a sequence of pairs where we, we modded out the larger of the numbers by the smaller of the numbers 
until we got down to a pair that was reduced such that one of the numbers was zero. Right? Recall GCD of AB equals GCD of BA. Doesn't really matter. So for example, when we computed the GCD of uh, 25 and 11, we went from the pair 25, comma 11, and then we swapped it for another pair of numbers. Let's, what is GCD of 25 and 11? We said it's 1, but let's go through the Euclidean algorithm. What is the GCD of 25 and 11? What do you do? GCD of 11 and then 25 minus 11. Which is what? Yeah. So you swap the larger number out. The smaller number now becomes a larger number, and you have a new pair of numbers. You go from 25 and 11 to 11 and 3. You swap the bigger number for a smaller number. The GCD doesn't change. We proved that. Then you take the GCD again. You're going to get. Uh, you're going to swap the bigger number, 11, for a smaller number. The smaller number is now a big number. And then, so what is 11 mod 3? 2. What is uh, 3 mod 2? Uh, what is uh, 2 mod 1? I guess it's 0, right? Yes. And then will you say, well, I have 0, and then I return 1, right? So that there is the GCD, right? Because that's our stopping condition, return A. Now, if you think about it, we really swapped pair, 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 pair. When you take the mod, that's kind of like a linear expression, right? There's no squaring or square rooting going on, no cubing or anything like this, right? So in fact, you can work backwards. You can start from the GCD and then, without any simplification, in fact, making it look more complicated, you can rework yourself back to a linear combination of 25 and 11. That's exactly how it works. We're going to start with the pair 1, 0, which is GCD and 0, which is the return answer. And then we're going to uh, reverse execute the algorithm to get the um, get us back to a linear combination of 25 and 11. So of course, it'll make sense when we illustrate it. So let's write out the GCD again, but in uh, something we'll call divisor form. When we took 25 and we modded it by 11, what we really did is we said it was equal in some division form of like uh, n is equal to like dq plus r, right? We divided it by d. We were left with some quotient and remainder. Uh, Q and R, right? So what we'll say is we'll do the same thing. Uh, this is what we're dividing by, and then we had a remainder 3. But what was the quotient? 2. Two yeah. Right? So you can write 25 as a linear combination of the next pair. 11 and 3 is the pair, is the next pair. So you take the bigger number and write it as a linear combination of the next pair. Then you repeat this for all the pairs going down. We want to write now 11 as a linear combination of the next pair, which is going to be 3, 2. And what goes here? 3, yes. Great. 11 is now a linear combination of 3, 2. So now we want to take the 3 here and write that as a linear combination of the next pair. It's going to be a linear combination of 2 and 1. What goes here? 1. one. Then we want to write 2 as a linear combination of the next pair, which is going to be 1, 0. So what is? Two. Yeah. Now, seems trivial at the end of it, but this is what you do. And of course, when you do this, you can either do it through when you're doing the algorithm at the same time. I like to do it at the end, and I have all my work shown, so it makes everything simpler. This is, I think, is a cumbersome thing. It's got a lot of moving symbols, a lot of double neg negations and stuff. What you want to do now is rewrite all your equations as the remainder equaling something, right? So if you have n is equal to dq plus r, you want to write this as r is equal to dq minus n, right? Then you can plug the remainder back into the previous one. You'll get all the way back to the top. You'll have 1 is equal to a linear combination of 25 and 11. So let's rewrite all of these equations. We have uh, 0 is equal to 
uh, 2 times 1 plus, and then we're sub subtracting 2. So it's going to be 2 times negative 1. Sort of 2 minus 2 is 0, almost ridiculous, but we're not going to simplify. We don't want to simplify. We want things to be ugly. So then when we work the math back up, we'll get our S and T. If you simplify, of course, you're just going to be left with the GCD, which is what? So, uh, 1 is the remainder here, and this is going to be equal to, I have 3 times 1 plus 2 times negative 1. One second. Yeah, that's fine. We subtracted the other side. Uh, then I have uh, 2 is equal to uh, our remainders again. 11 times 1 plus uh, 3 times negative 3. Do you agree? And then the final one is going to be 3 as 25 and 11. So it's going to be 25 times 1 plus uh, 11 times negative 3, right? Now, of course, things are sort of arbitrary where I'm choosing to put the minus sign. I uh, yes, yes, thank you. Why am I choosing this to write as 11 times negative 2 instead of negative 11 times 2 or whatever? I want to write 3 as 25s plus 11t, right? So I'm saying the negative is going to go there. That's, the, that's basically the only reason we're doing this conventionally. Now what we're going to do is write the GCD back from the base pair all the way up to the top, right? So we have the GCD of 25 and 11 we know is 1, right? And 1 is equal to 1 plus 0. That's a linear combination of our last pair, 1 and 0. Do we agree? Ah, but what is 0 equal to? We have an equation here. So what we're simply going to do is substitute out this 0 for the equation of 0. 1 is then equal to 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 2 times negative 1. Now, of course, it looks like it's getting more complicated, but that's what we want. We're going to then simplify this, go all the way back to the top, and we'll have a combination of 25 and 11. Let's, simplif let's simplify this to see what we got. You usually don't want to leave, you want to leave the, the right one alone. So we'll leave that one alone, and we'll get... Uh, 2 times negative 1. Then, what is 2 times 1 times 1? This number and this number are going to be the same. So, what is 1 plus 2 times 1? Three, 3 times 1. Yeah, so it's going to be 1 times 3. Right? Now, notice we wrote 1 from the first pair, 1, 0, to the second pair, 2, 1. Right? We're going from... 1, 0 to 2, 1. Then you simply repeat. You take the smaller number here, the 1, and you replace it. So if we replace it with the second equation, what is that going to look like? That's going to look like 1 is equal to 2, negative 1, plus, and then you substitute in the 1 equation, 3, 1, plus 2, negative 1, times 3. Now, what is 3 times 3? 3 times 3? Yeah, but we want 3 times 3. It is 9. But if you simplify too much, you'll just get 1. You'll get 9 minus 8, which is 1. And that's not very helpful to us. We want to write it as 3 times 3. So we're going to multiply this one by the inside here and just pull this out. We want the bigger number out. These two are the same. These are both multiples of 2. So 3 times, we're going to not multiply it by the 2. We're going to multiply it by the inside. So 2 times... 1 times negative 3 is going to be 2 times negative 3. 2 times negative 3 plus 2 times negative 1 is what? 2 times negative 4? Exactly, yeah. So we have a linear combination of the next pair. We went from 0, 1, 0. We went to 2, 1. And now we're at 3, 2, right? We went from here to here to here. Then we're going to go to 11, 3, and then 25, 11 at the end, right? Um, look at that. We have a 2 here. 
let's replace 2 with this equation. That's going to give us 1 is equal to 3 times 3 plus 2, which is actually 11 times 1, plus 3 times negative 3, times negative 4. Right. We again want to leave the 11 alone, because that's the one we want to keep. But these are going to be multiples of 3. So we pull the 11 out. That's going to be 11 times negative 4. Right. And then we're going to have, what is negative 3 times negative 4? 12, and then the 3 is going to be, what's 12 plus 3? 15. So we pull the 3 we, out of those, we get 3, 15. Would you agree that 1 is equal to 11 times negative 4 plus 3 times 15? You see, as we get farther and farther from the one of those things, like, well, I have to take a second to calculate that. That's 44 minus, uh, that's 45 minus 44, which is still 1, right? But now we've written it as a combination of 11 and 3. One last one, we're going to replace this 3 with a linear combination of 25 and 11. As we simplify 11 plus a linear combination of 25 and 11, it's going to give us a linear combination of 25 and 11. So we're going to get 1 is equal to 11 times negative 4 plus our last equation, which is 25, 1 plus 11, negative 2. Sorry, my marker's bad. That whole thing is multiplied by 15. We're going to pull the 25 out. Uh, so 25 times 15 is going to be 25 times 15. Plus, we have an 11. What's negative 2 times 15? Negative 30. Negative 30. Negative 30 plus negative 4? Negative 34. 11 times negative 34. So what's our S and T now? We see that uh, for 25S plus 11T to equal 1, we have S is equal to 15. T is equal to negative 34. Now, is that the first answer? No. I think the answer of... Uh, 4 and negative 9 was much simpler, obviously, right? I don't even want to think about multiplication of 11 times negative 34 or 25 times 15. But it doesn't guarantee, this, this is called the extended Euclidean algorithm. It doesn't, care, it doesn't guarantee that we get the smallest pair, the nicest looking pair, or anything like that. It simply guarantees that it'll find you a pair. So this is how the extended Euclidean algorithm works. A little cumbersome to do with pen and paper, but it exists, right? The extended Euclidean algorithm is exactly what helps you find um, uh, this S and T. And the whole topic of today will be how useful this S and T is. It's quite powerful. Any questions on this, though? Yes? Do you like set up a matrix to, to do it? Yeah. The way I like to do it is I like to write the GCD Euclidean algorithm first. I like to rewrite it, and then I like to substitute and simplify. Could you do this with, like, a matrix? I suppose. Honestly, for for a small s for a small a and b, you could probably guess and check much simpler than you can do this. But for large s and t, a computer would implement this. Excuse me, for large a and b, a computer could do this. Right. The point of, of course, of an algorithm is not for like some specific a and b that you could find in s and t, but for every a, a, a and b. And convince yourself this is not a proof. But convince yourself this could generalize. Because the GCD goes through those pairs, we can go backwards through those pairs. We'll get back to A and B. That's the important part. More questions on the extended Euclidean algorithm? Excellent. All right, let's get into some very elementary group theory. Um, so mathematicians are good at making up things. So they have uh, things to study. When they run out of things to study, they make up new stuff. And then they can get funding for studying problems they made up. But it's like, you know, no one would, ha they ask all these interesting questions, but if they never asked the questions, they would not have any problems to solve. So group theory is basically that. It's like, it's totally made up, but it has a lot of deep math in it. 
we're going to do some really elementary uh, group theory. A group is basically an abstract mathematical object that behaves symmetrically. It has a lot of the nice properties that we believe that numbers have. So a group is defined axiomatically, and then certain instances happen to behave like a group. The motivation is that the numbers, the real numbers or the natural numbers or whatever numbers you look at, have a kind of symmetry. And we want to see what other structures kind of act like the numbers in some sense. So a group uh, is defined with the following axioms. A group is, in some, uh, is a pair. It's a set G and an operation, a binary operation, we'll call the multiplication operation. But it may not be multiplication itself. It's a general operation, right? It can be anything depending upon what the group is. And that'll be clear when we do some examples. But it's called, there's a few axioms. There's only four. Identity um, says that there exists an E in G such that for all A in G, that AE is equal to EA is equal to A. In some sense, the identity is an element of the group that acts like a 1. Right? Convince yourself that E, I'm using the letter E here, but if G was like a group of numbers, which we'll talk about in a second, that's exactly the property you would want for multiplication by one to have. Right? Um, associativity, you can guess what this one is going to say, is that the multiplication operation is associative uh, for all A, B, C, and G. It is true that A, B, C is equal to A, B, C. Okay. Um, that's the definition of associativity. Uh, we have closure. And basically, it says, like, if you perform an operation within the group, you stay within the group. That's all it means. So, for example, um, for all A, comma, B in G, uh, a, B is an element of G. You take two elements of the group, you perform the operation, you remain in the group. Um, inverses exist. Uh, for all A in G, there exists an element called A inverse in G, such that A, A inverse is equal to A inverse A, which is equal to uh, G. Excuse me, is equal to E. One second. Whatever, it's fine. I just want to make sure my recording doesn't bonk. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, so this is the four basic properties that we observe numbers have. And then we were like, okay, what else has these properties, right? So let me give you some examples of a group. Um, any questions on the axioms first? In math, you, del you don't consider like intuitively what examples should have these properties, but you look only at the rules. And that allows a lot of creative answers to the same problem. Consider the integers, so like positive and negative numbers and zero, under addition. I claim that the integer integers under addition is a group. And again, although we defined it as a dot and use a multiplic multiplicative notation, uh, here we're going to talk about addition, right? The integers under addition form a group. Why? The identity exists. What is the identity of the integers with respect to addition? Um, a plus zero. Is zero. A plus zero is equal to <laughs> zero plus A is equal to A. So the identity is zero. OK? Um, associativity, addition is associative. I, I'm not even going to write it. Closure, is it true that the sum of two integers is an integer? Yeah. yeah, you don't get any weird division or anything, so that one's also true. Inverses exist. Inverses exist. What is A inverse? Negative A. Negative A. Why? A plus negative A is equal to zero. Similarly, negative A plus A is equal to zero, right? So every, according to addition, Every number has an inverse, minus a, because a plus minus a puts you back at zero, right? Associativity you get for free closure, you get for free an identity, you have to just say it's zero, right? 
zero is an identity with respect to addition, right? But what about um, multiplication? Let's consider the real numbers without zero with respect to multiplication. Is this a group? Uh, what's the identity of the real numbers with respect to multiplication? One. So, because 1a is equal to a1 is equal to a, right, with respect to multiplication. 1, we would say, is a multiplicative identity. 0 is like an additive identity. We remove 0 for a very important reason. It sort of destroys the group structure. Uh, is it associative? Is it associative? Uh, a, b, c is equal to a, b, c. Okay, I mean, that sort of follows easily from the definition. Uh, do we have closure? If for all a, uh, uh, b in the, nat in the reals, does that imply that a, b is a real? Yeah, we get that one for free as well. Easy group. What about uh, inverses? What is the inverse of a? One over a, yeah. That's the reason we remove zero. So the inverse is kind of like one over a in general. But specifically for the reals, the inverse is a number such that when you multiply it, you get back to the identity. That's what an inverse is supposed to be. In general group theory, you may see a inverse, and you may always assume, you have, without even thinking about it, always assume that a inverse is one over a. That's only true in specific universes of discourse. Thankfully, it's the popular universe of discourse. That you're always working within the real numbers, which is the good ones. But in general group theory, it's not necessarily true that the inverse is um, 1 over a. I mean, because sometimes, you, you'll, as you'll see today, we're, you may be working in a group that that's not true for. Uh, let's do another example. Let's do a finite group. So interestingly, both these examples are of infinite sets. There are finite groups that still have the same symmetric properties of the numbers. We're going to do the group uh, Zn with respect to the operation is addition mod n. And Zn, again, is the number 0 to n minus 1. Right? I claim that Zn with respect to addition mod n is a group. What's the identity? Recall the identity is an element of the group such that when you add it or multiply it to any of the elements, it doesn't do anything. Zero. Zero, a plus zero mod n is a, right? Right? Um, associativity and closure, I'll claim you get for free. Associativity. I claim you get. Uh, why do you get closure? Why is it true if that a and b are elements of zn? Why does that imply that a, b, mod n is an element of zn? Why is that true? Exactly. Thankfully, mod is just going to make sure it's between 0 and n minus 1, and therefore it's in zn. So it does the work of closure for us. Um, inverses exist. What is the inverse of A for any element A? This one's tricky because we're working multiplicatively. Yes? I just have a question about the last even. OK. Um, for that closure part, why is it A times B mod N instead of A plus B? Oh, yes. Thank you. Is the inverse n minus a? The inverse is n minus a. Why? a plus n minus a is equal to n. So a plus n minus a is congruent to 0 mod n. And 0 is, again, our identity. right? Every element has an inverse. The inverse of 3 uh, mod 10 is going to be 10 minus 3, which is 7. right? It's almost like n minus a is almost like 
with respect to the mod, it's kind of like negative a. So same thing. Interesting though, this is an object with the same mathematical symmetry as the numbers with addition or as the reals with multiplication, but it's a finite group. There's only finitely many elements, yet it has some symmetry. That's kind of interesting. Um, let's do two more examples. Um, let's do a Z5 without zero under multiplication mod n. We get rid of the zero usually when we do multiplication because zero acts like an annihilator. It doesn't act like an identity. It's kind of a bad thing to have. This Z5 consists of the elements 1, 2, 3, and 4 mod, mod n, right? So here mod n, excuse me, mod 5. So we're going to do a fixed example, but we're going to do mod 5, right? Um, what's the identity? 1. 1 times n is 1, right? Uh, what is, is it associative? Yes. Do you get closure by mod? Yes, you get closure. So let's skip to the inverses. Instead of doing the inverses first, we're actually going to multiply all possible elements. So I'm going to write a table 1, 2, 3, 4 here, and then here I'm going to write 1, 2, 3, 4. All right? And let's just fill in the table mod 5. This is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. 2, 3, 4, right? What is 2 times 2 mod 5 is 4? What is 2 times 3 mod 5? 1. 1. What is 2 times 4 mod 5? 3. 3 times 2 mod 5? 3 times 3 mod 5? Three times two, three times four mod five. Yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to be quick. Uh, three times two mod five. Three times four times three mod five, and then four times four mod five. One. Notice that each row and column contain the numbers one, two, three, four. We get that sort of the finite group symmetry that you should have, right? The product of the numbers is going to be one of those one, two, or three, or four, right? Now, do inverses exist? Uh, what's the inverse of 1? Just 1. That one's easy. Here's, the, here's the, the illustrated point. What's the inverse of 2? Now, again, inverse of 2 is not 1 over 2. 1 half is not an element of the group. The inverse of 2 is some number x such that 2 times x is congruent to 1 mod 5. It's a number 1, 2, 3, or 4 such that when you multiply it by 2, you get 1. So what is the inverse of 2? It's 3. The inverse of 2 is 3. That should be surprising. That's because we're not working in the reals where you do 1 over. We're working within C5. What is the inverse of 3 then? 2? Yeah. The inverse of the inverse is the original. We get all same nice symmetric properties that numbers have, but we're not working in the natural numbers. We're working in a toy, you know? Why? Because 2 times 3 is 6, mod 5 is 1. The inverse of 3 is 2. Last one, what is the inverse of 4? 4. What you can do is go to the table and look where the 1 appears. It's 4. That's also interesting. The inverse of 2 and 3 are each other. The inverse of 4 is itself. Mm, kind of weird. Kind of a different structure than we're used to. There's not a unique inverse here. That's OK, but there is, a diff there is at least an inverse for each one. OK? Uh, I'm going to give you one more example of a weird group, and it's called the dihedral group. Um, the dihedral group is a set of symmetries over a uh, body. You guys know the definition of a regular polygon? Polygon is regular basically if it's nice looking, if all the sides have the same length and all the ang interior angles are the same and everything. So an equilateral triangle is a three regular polygon, right? So consider, consider we take a piece of cardboard and we put, a po and we put uh, an equilateral triangle in it. That looks hopefully equilateral, okay? And this is called D3. 
D3 contains the set of ways that you can cut the triangle, pop it out of the piece of cardboard, position it, and then push it back into the piece of cardboard so that it fits. What are some ways that you can take a piece of cardboard, a triangle, an equilateral triangle, all sides and all angles are the same, such that you could pull it out of the cardboard, maneuver it, and push it back in? What is a way? Rotate it. Um... What are some other ways besides rotation? So how many ways can you rotate it first? Let's, let's talk about that. What are the rotations? If you have 360 degrees and you push A to B, or B to A, what is that? Let's say you push A to C first. Uh, 120 degrees. So we'll say the rotation is of one, R120. That's a rotation of 120 degrees. Uh, what happens if you rotate it from A to B? R240. That's R240, which ends up being R negative 120. So this is R, we'll call it R240. It means rotate it 240 degrees. Right? What are some other ways you could position the triangle? R360. R360? What is 360? Zero. There is a do nothing operation. Here's a way to pop the triangle out and put it, maneuver it and put it back in. Do nothing. That's always an option. Doing nothing is always uh, an option. So rotate it zero. Those are three things you can do. There are three more. Flip it. Flip it. Uh, how many ways can you flip it? Three times. There's three axi of symmetry. We'll call this uh, F1. We'll call this F2. We'll call this F3. You can take one, flip it, push it back in. Now, is it backwards? Yeah, but that's still allowed. So there's six ways you can pop the triangle out, position it, and put it back in. I claim that this is a group. The identity is what? R0. R0. Uh, what is the inverse of, we'll do a few. We won't do the whole group structure. What is the inverse of 240? Huh? 120. Rotate 240. Rotate another two, 120, you've rotated 360, you're back to the start. That's the identity. So the inverse of 240 is R120. Similarly, the inverse of R120 is R240. What is the inverse of F1? F1? Okay. Yeah, you flip it. Yeah, I'll just flip it again. Okay. So we could work those out. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm not going to fill in a large table because it would be 6 times 6 would be 36 things in the table, but I'll just give you an example. What is R120 and composed with uh, all F, let's say F1? By comp the operation D3, D3, the operation is not a multiplication, it's not an addition. What it is is a composition, which means do the first thing, then do the second thing. It's a sequence of, op it's a, the group operator is do the thing, then do the thing. So what that means is, do R120 and then do F1. I claim this is, well, let's make this F2 because I already computed that one. I claim this is going to give you some element of D3. What element is it? Let's figure it out. You start with the basics. You start with A, B, C, right? When you rotate it 120, you're going to rotate it 120 and then flip it F2. So what is this going to be? After you rotate it 120, what is it going to be? Yes. Okay. B at the top. Now when you flip it by F2, and we just said F2 is you flip it across the bottom left fixed, that's going to be, this one is going to stay the same. C and A are going to swap. Excuse me, B and A are going to swap. Okay. Uh, this is an operation, but you could get to this position in one 
element of D3. What is it? It's F1. See? So R120 composed with F2 gets you F1. See? You rotate it flipped. It's as if you just flipped it on the other axis. I claim for all combinations of this, you could even three or four combinations, associativity is true. You can get uh, an element back of D3. Now, what's the point of this? The point of this is this has nothing to do with numbers. There's no numbers here, yet it has a lot of the same symmetry and properties that numbers have. So we can, by studying a generic group, there's so many interesting things that can look like groups that have nothing to do with numbers, but they imi imitate the symmetry of groups. Here we see polygons, but there's also, you can do groups of functions, you can do groups of permutations, you can do groups of equations, you can do groups of, uh, as we see, numbers, uh, shapes, all kinds of weird things happen under certain operations to look just like the numbers do. So it's a very interesting mathematical structure that we have for group theory. Any questions on the dihedral group? You'll never see this again. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, it could, since, since there are like two ways to flip it, do you have to like consider that? Whenever well, you're... what do you mean two ways to flip it? Like this, this? Consider that it's not double-sided. Let's just define it to be that way. If we were, I claim if, it were, if we were considering double-sidedness, then there would be like 12 things to consider because each letter would also have a back side, so it would be a little more complicated. But you could make a group that way, I'm sure. More questions? You can do, you could generalize this for a square or like an eye shape or anything else, right? So we want to concern ourselves with what has the nice, interesting group properties and what does not. Okay, I claim, uh, oh my God. Z6 without zero, recall we did this for Z5, multiplication mod six. We showed that Z5 was a group because every element had an inverse. I claim that Z6 is not a group, though. Z6 is not a group. Let's try to prove it. What, are, what possible elements of Z6 are there? It's 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 mod 6, right? Uh, and there's no 0. So what would the inverse of 2 be? The inverse of 2, I claim, doesn't exist in this group, so it's not a group. Every element must have an inverse for it to be a group. But two, I'm going to prove to you now, it does not have a group. Let's just manually compute two times everything and see what happens. Uh, we get two times one, two times two, two times three, two times four, and two times five. Two times one mod six is what? Uh, two times two mod six is what? Two times three mod six is what? Zero is not an element of the group. So already, actually, we don't even have closure. Zero is not defined here. So, I mean, like, well, that's bad. So that's not a group. What is two times four? Uh, what is two times five? OK. So we see, actually, that like, not only is, do we not have closure, we don't have an inverse. None of these are equal to one. We get two, four, zero, two, four. In fact, if you repeat this, you get two, four, zero, two, four, zero, two, four, zero. So we don't get an inverse for two here. The next question we have is for what n, so z5 was a group, z6 not a group. What n is zn without zero a group? We want to solve that question, and then we're done for today. That's the last thing we want to prove. Um, so what we want to do is you, if you consider an inverse of like, consider an inverse of 3x is congruent to 1 mod 12. Okay? Suppose we're working in the mod 12 group. We want to find the inverse of 3. What is mod 12? When you think of mod 0 arithmetic, a lot of times it's called clock math because you draw the clock. We got 12. Instead of 12, we're going to do 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay? And when you do 3 times x, 3 times x is really like 
3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, right? x times. So if we want some number inverse of 3 to be x, what we're going to do is we're going to add 3 to itself several times and just see what happens. Let me see if we have a different color. Oh, don't. Okay, whatever. So if we add 3 to itself, we're going to start at 3 and then add it to itself several times to see what happens. Uh, when we add 3 to itself, what's going to happen? 3 plus 3 is what? Yeah. What is 6 plus 3? What is 9 plus 3? What's 0 plus 3? All right, so we get into a cycle. Notice that we skipped over 1. We didn't hit the 1. That's not good. We want, so 3 doesn't have an inverse, actually. So we want to consider other numbers that will hit the 1. Let's try 6. What's the inverse of 6? What's 6 plus 6? And what's 0 plus 6? OK. I don't have colors. You'll have to help me be creative here. So if you put 6 on the clock, it's going to go between 6 and 0, 6 and 0, 6 and 0, 6 and 0. It's never going to hit 1. What about, um, let's do 4. Let's do the last one. Let's 4. Uh, 4 plus 4? And what's 8 plus 4? And what's 0 plus 4? 4 also doesn't have an inverse. But notice something here. The, the cycle length times the number is equal to 12. 6, 2 cycle, 12. 4, triangle, 12. 3, square, 12. Right? So we get actually some interesting symmetry. Let's do one more. Let's do a number that actually doesn't divide into 12 then. Give me a number that doesn't divide into 12. Let's do 5. 5 doesn't divide into 12, right? 2 divides into 12 even. What is 5 plus 5 mod uh, uh, 12? OK, hopefully you guys can read that. What is 10 plus 5 mod 12? 3? 15 mod 12 is 3? Three. 3? What's 3 plus 5 mod 12? Next. Next. 6. Next. 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 OK. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, the length of that cycle is what? It hit every number. So it's 12, right? So a number is only going to hit the 1 if what? And what do we say about that? If it doesn't divide into 12, the GCD of it is 12, is 1, excuse me. So here's what we'll prove. We'll prove that uh, the GCD of A and N is equal to 1 if and only if, make sure I get the statement exact, A inverse exists mod N. And that can help us determine what is a group or what isn't a group. If A inverse exists mod N, then the GCD of A and N must be 1. And if the GCD of A and N is 1, then the inverse of A exists. Observe that 2 and 6, the GCD of those two was not 1. 2 did divide into 6, so it didn't hit the 1. That's basically what we're going to prove. This is actually relatively trivial to prove, um, but it'll help us motivate what is or isn't a group. Questions on the statement of this theorem we're going to prove now? We're going to prove the GCD of A and N is 1 if and only if the inverse exists. Questions? All right, let's do uh, the forward way. So the GCD of A and N is equal to 1. We want to show that A inverse exists mod N. 
So what is, if GCD of A uh, and A and N is equal to 1, what do we know? Let's actually just apply our best tool in the book. Let's apply Bayesian's theorem. If GCD of A of N is equal to 1, we know that there exists uh, ST uh, such that uh, AS plus NT is equal to what? What is the statement of Bayesian's? And GCD is what? Right? So we know then that AS is equal to 1 uh, excuse me, AS is congruent to 1 mod N. Do you agree? If you take AS plus NT and that's equal to 1, if you take AS and you mod it, and you take AS plus NT and you mod it by N, you get 1. Do we agree? A inverse is just S mod N. Okay, so A inverse exists. Questions on the first direction of the proof? Are we convinced? Yes. Would that be S mod N, or do we, can we just leave it as S? S what? Did you say that it's going to be S mod N? Or yeah, S let's mod it, yeah. Because S, let's say it's like negative 34. We want to put it between 0 and n minus 1. So we'll say if you take negative 34 and you mod it by n, it'll be between 0 and n minus 1. You'll mod up and so on. So let's just say that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, how is, um, is it because nt mod n is just uh, 0. 0? Exactly. When you mod out, you get rid of all. You, when you mod out, you'll, you'll only be between 0 and n minus 1. If anything's a multiple of n, it vanishes. You replace n with 0. Um, the backwards way, slightly more difficult. Uh, suppose A inverse exists mod N. Then we know what? We know that A, A inverse is congruent to 1 mod N, right? Sorry, my markers are terrible. From here, we may drop the mod and convert it to uh, a normal equation. So we're going to, if we drop the mod, we have to add by a multiple of n, right? So what we have actually then is that uh, this means that a, a inverse minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod n. Do we agree? That means that a, a inverse minus 1 is equal to cn for some c. Do we agree with that step? Working with the rules of modular arithmetic. OK? From here, it perhaps it's almost clear what you could say. We get a, a inverse minus cn is equal to 1. That's almost enough for us to apply Bayes-Zutz, right? Uh, let uh, the GCD of a and n is equal to d. We prove that d is equal to 1. If the GCD of a of n is equal to d, then we know that d divides a and d divides n. So there exists like k and l such that dk is equal to a, dl is equal to n. So we replace these into the equation. We're going to get dk uh, a inverse uh, plus uh, minus cn uh, dl, which is equal to 1. And we pull a d out of there. So we get d k a inverse minus cl is equal to 1. From here, what's the last step? There's one final step. D divides, one. D divides into 1. D divides into 1. But d is supposed to be a number greater than or equal to 1. The only number that's greater than or equal to 1 that divides into 1 is 1. QED. They're relatively prime. All right. 
Last remark, we know that the inverse A exists if and only if the GCD of A and N are 1. In fact, if and only if. Uh, Zn without 0, and under the operation of multiplication, mod n, uh, is a group if and only if what? What n does this imply for, right? If you choose an n, and it has a number less than it that divides into it, that means it, that number doesn't have an inverse. So then it's not a group. So there's only a few kinds of numbers that have this property, such that Zn without 0 is a group. What is it? Prime. It's a prime number. Why? Every number that divides into a prime number is either 1 or itself. And those, are, those we don't really care about from Zn. So Zn0 is a group mod n if and only if n is prime. So 5 was prime, 6 is not prime. So 5 is a group, 6 is not, right? Last, last comment is that uh, mathematicians still like to study groups mod a certain number. So what they do is they just ignore all the no numbers that are not, that don't have inverses, and they end up with a group. So for example, uh, they use this notation, uh, z uh, over z nz under multiplication. This means the group mod n, but you ignore all the elements that are not, that don't have inverses. So you just throw everything out. That's not nice. For example, uh, what are the elements of z, uh, 12z, with respect to multiplication? What are all the numbers less from, from 1 to 11 uh, that don't divide into 12? Well, we have 1. What else do we have? Five. What else? Seven. One more. Eleven. So Z12, Z over Z12, Z, with respect to multiplication, only has four elements. All the other ones don't have inverses. So that's actually a group uh, with respect to modular multiplication. Right. Any final questions on, on this? Excellent.